a trend, right? Oh, okay. So, uh, hello everybody in uh, Facebook land. Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto and I'm back again uh, with another Facebook Live event. And this is for uh, my current book release, The Best New True Crime Stories, Crimes of Passion, Obsession, and Revenge. And I'm joined by who, uh, a gentleman who's sort of become a bit of a regular now, uh, Mr. Joe Turner from the UK. Hi, Joe. Hi, how are you? I'm not bad. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. I'm all the better for seeing you. So <laughs> you buttering me up to get in the next anthology, right? Next one, number four. Would that be a record, number four? Have you had uh, no, you've been beaten, I think, by Anthony Ferguson. Oh, awesome. uh, damn Aussie! Yeah, <laughs> you gotta watch out for those Aussies. What? What's after? That one is there another one? Uh, well, um, I well, there's a new book coming out after the new year, which is um, the Partners in Crime volume. Oh, You're not in that, that, are you? I, I forgot, one. I don't know who's in anything anymore. I have to check everything, uh, and then after that is uh, Crimes of the Famous and Infamous. Um, are you in that one? That's the one I'm in. Oh, that's the one you're in. And then I have another one I'm working on, but that's not even, I, I, that's still ongoing. And I think you're working on a piece for that. Have you, which ones have you not revealed? That yeah, one? we talked about it in the green room. No, that's the one you just mentioned. That's crimes. No, of the no, no. That's crimes of the famous and infamous is the one you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, was, I, I yeah. see. <laughs> Sorry, I got mixed up there. Okay, yes. Now the viewers have probably shut off the thing now saying, I don't know what book we're talking about. We're talking about this one today. This is the one we're talking about today. <laughs> the noir one, the noir. Yeah, just let's stay on track here. We start talking about something that's not even existing yet. Um, anyways, Joe's written a really cool story. Um, it's called I've Seen the Dead Come Alive. Uh, with a with a title like that, you figure there's definitely some a lot of dimension going on in this story. Um, before we get into the details, too many details of the story, um, give us an idea. Where does the story take place, and when does it take place? This is this is a contemporary piece, right? Yes, 2009 is when it took place, and it was in uh, Virginia, Farmville, Virginia, small town, not West Virginia. That's a different place altogether, which I found out during the research first. Thought it was just the west part of Virginia, but <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, two different states. That's a small town kind of uh, kind of vibe. Um, young girl meets young guy I think, on the internet. They meet up. Doesn't go as planned. That's the the basic gist of it. Uh, yeah, this was. Um, uh... We, we, we uh, this this actually uh, the internet. This is the famous MySpace, wasn't yes. it? Yes. It Does was. MySpace still exist? <laughs> I think so. It's a it's a music streaming platform there, which is for like bands and solo artists and stuff like that. Yeah, but yeah. it was it used to be more so like a like almost a Facebook kind of thing where you would meet people with other interests and chat mm -hmm. and post stuff and and maybe it would transfer into in person meetings. Absolutely. I actually met someone on MySpace. He became my gig buddy in London. <laughs> Really? I can see. Yeah, yeah. No, so, yeah. I mean, I know, I mean, in this particular instance, things go very wrong with the MySpace platform, but you could actually, you know, it, it worked out well for me because this guy always had a free ticket for something. And thanks to him, I finally saw Depeche Mode. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So you're happy yeah. you're which, which is a departure from our story. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so this was um, just a few years ago, correct? The early part of the 21st century? Uh, 2009, it happened in. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's just about uh, what 12, 12, whatever years ago. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know, I'm losing track. We're going into 2022 now. Um, now, there's a core element in this story that involves a, a specific genre of music uh, or hip hop music. Uh, now, this was all new to me when when uh, I got your story. I'd never actually heard of this, and I was Googling it and checking it out because I'm like, what is this? Um, but perhaps you can explain to our viewers as well, um, what is horrorcore rap? Horrorcore rap, it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's rap music with the, the lyrics and the themes are all kind of based around morbid and gruesome imagery like uh, you know, serial killers and demons and ghosts and ghouls and you know mythological creatures stuff like that 
um, it's uh, everyone knows Eminem, and Eminem is kind of in that category because you know he raps about you know, murder and then killing people and dressing up as Jason Voorhees and stuff like that. Um, but Eminem has obviously taken it to the stratosphere, and he's kind of he's kind of a regular rap artist with horrorcore kind of mixed in there occasionally. But the genre of horrorcore itself is, you know, all that kind of thing constantly. You know, no, no raps about anything else. All just based around like murder is the common thing, really. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty much it. And it's kind of linked with them. Um, you might remember, you might remember new metal from back in the late nineties, early two thousands. There were bands like um, Corn and Limp Bizkit and Link Park and stuff like that. And horrorcore is kind of a a natural progression of that, but with kind of, you know, with, with less guitar-based work. But but specifically, they they seem to be focused on 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 really grim subject matter and and, and murder. Yeah, it seems a weird combination for you know rap and solely about murder because there's a lot of other genres that are also about murder and killing and gruesome stuff and and whatever. But this horrorcore just seems to. I don't know how the two kind of married together in such a way, but but he did. But this isn't like, for instance, a, a, a rap piece where they're maybe uh, uh, rapping about things going on in, in their area, uh, you know, with, with gangs and, and murder and, and this kind of thing. This is sort of almost like a, a, when you say horror, the horror element is it's, it goes down that avenue, right? A lot of the rappers seem to take on. So I'm not a big fan of it myself. I don't really like rap or or horrorcore at all. A lot of the, um, the musicians they seem to take on personas. Like they seem to play characters rather than rapping about their own lives, which is quite a quite fascinating. Really. Okay, so okay, so it's almost as if you have a horror genre and then you just rap rap horror. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, so not, um the the. It's not very good music if you, if you listen to it subjectively, objectively, sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm, no, I'm not a fan. So I'm not surprised it never really got popular because it's kind of terrible and kind of attracts the, as, you know, as you'll see in the story, kind of attracts the amateur musicians who don't really have all the musical talent in the world but want to be musicians. So, yeah, we'll find that yeah. out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, the the main protagonist in our story um, is a young man who uh, considered himself a horrorcore artist, um, and and he went by the uh, horrorcore artist name of Psycho Sam, spelled S Y K O. Obviously, you're not going to spell it the correct way. You're going to kind of modify that. See, that's another thing with rap. Everything's spelled with a Z, or you know, the substitute an S for a Z. Why not? They're all all the names are spelled differently. Writers everywhere cringe. I know the English language is like disappearing. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. tell us a bit about uh, Psycho Sam. Who who was he? Uh, where was he from? Well, how old was he? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He, uh, he was 19 when he met. Um, well, when when he first knew the story, he was 19 years old. He was from uh, a small village in California. He lived with his, his uh, father and his sister, and he was a very much uh, isolated kind of kid. He was he kept to himself. He was a graphic designer. He spent his time playing, recording his own music, playing video games. He wasn't really the biggest, you know, social butterfly. Um, he he didn't have many friends at all. I mean, he was bullied throughout school. He, when you see what he looked like, you can understand why because he was kind of a chunky kid, he had ginger hair, greasy ginger hair, he always dressed in black. In the, uh, he looked like your typical, he looked like a goth kid really, but he was into this rap genre. So yeah, you can see why he'd be a good target to for, for bullies and whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah so he wasn't, he wasn't exactly somebody who attracted the ladies. No, not at all. I mean, yeah, I don't think he, prior to meeting the protagonist in our story don't think he would ever never had a girlfriend according to his friends he just kept to himself and he wasn't really a, a ladies man so you can yeah and and so he basically uh my space was his avenue for it was his platform for his for his uh his art so to speak and uh he he essentially started to uh make friends if that's accurate he tried to, yeah he made a lot of friends in the, the horrorcore scene 
And one of those friends that he reached out to was this girl named Emma. Well, she reached out to him first because she was a fan. And then that's how, that's how they connected. He, uh, he met most of his allies through MySpace and, and the internet in general. Well, I think it's important to note as well that uh, his social circle on MySpace was co pretty much confined to the online world, right? I don't think he was out actually meeting these people in person, was he? Until um, Emma. Until Emma, yeah. He knew a few of them because he worked as a graphic designer for some of the other horrorcore artists. That's okay. Funny. He tried to worm his way into the industry. Uh, but yeah, he, he wasn't really outgoing and meeting these people in person. He wasn't in clubs every weekend or some of them. He was very much alone. Okay, and and tell us about Emma then. He is uh, she she's the young lady who's in Virginia, uh, and uh, she you know it sounded like she had a lot in common with with Psycho Sam, who it's Richard McCroskey, right? That's his name. Yeah, well, she was kind of a she was a loner as well, but she was a little, a little more popular. She was from Farmville, Virginia, um, and she was like homeschooled for a lot of her life, so she never really had a chance to meet many people. So again, she would also use MySpace to reach out to people in this same genre because she was a horror club fan that was her kind of calling in life um so yeah that's how she she actually managed to widen her social circle through my space because you know she was a, a young attractive young girl she but she had interpersonal skills you know she had you know she was able to socialize with these people you know because she had the skills to do that uh, and that's how she reached out to psycho sam or richard as you want to she was called sam sadly uh yeah, and that's how the two originally connected. And that was in early 2009. And so so um, essentially what we're going to have here is uh, an online romance that developed between these two individuals that, that initially seemed like they had a lot in common, uh, including their, their, in a way, alienation from everybody. Um, so we have an online romance and uh, it finally moves offline. And uh, we should just say it goes really, really wrong. Would that be accurate to say? It goes very badly. They um, they were talking for about, about nine months in total. So, you know, but these two lonely kids professing their love for each other over the internet. And the only thing that they really bonded over was this horror core genre of music. Um, but in my personal opinion, I think it was because they were so isolated that that's what they bonded over. Like, if they took horror core away, they wouldn't really have much to talk about. Um, and I think that when they did finally meet in person. I'm so sorry. Yeah, they're going my face. <laughs> the COVID is coming. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, um, yeah, when they did finally meet, uh, when Richard Sam came to stay at her place for two weeks, that was when they realized, was when Emma realized this guy is not someone I can be with because we've got nothing in common. Become two completely different personalities. The only thing they liked was the same music, and they couldn't really base a relationship on, on such a thing. But Emma had agreed to accommodate Sam for two weeks because they were going to a festival. And then, you know, they were. I mean, I couldn't understand that why they would think they would be a compatible match if they only ever talked online briefly or, or you know, sparingly, I should say. But when you've got to entertain them for two weeks and you have to spend 24 hours with them, you can kind of see where, you know, oh, we've got nothing to talk about anymore. We've got nothing in common other than this music. What do we do? That's when she realized, yeah, this isn't the basis of a relationship. And also, uh, he didn't quite look the same. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not familiar with how he how it, uh, if he had like photos online or they were just photos that just sort of didn't really show him as accurately as he was in person. Pretty much. He had a lot of um, top down selfies kind of poses. And he was always um, because he was a horrorcore artist himself. He was occasionally like dressed up, you know, he'd have like face paint on and stuff and his hair would be all mobile. So Emma only saw him when he was, you know, old enough to the nines. She never saw him when he was just in baggy clothes and hoodies looking all greasy and stuff like that. So when she saw him in the flesh, she was like, uh, no, can't be near him. And she didn't feel that spark at all. She just, there. You know, when you meet someone who used to meet, you think, oh, God, we will never get on. 
She, uh, well, I guess the choice of online dating, which I suppose they were, on, even though MySpace isn't a, a dating platform, that they, they were kind of using it as a dating romance absolutely. platform. Yeah, and it would have been a double, uh, double powerful because they'd been talking for nine months, and it felt like one of the first online romances that both of them ever had. So when you meet and you realize, oh, you know, it's a real big kick in the balls. Is even oh, worse yeah. than the everyday rejection. So because they built up this, it was Emma and Sam and built up this idea that they were going to enter into a, you know, a world in romance, and it didn't happen that way. It was a big, a big learning curve for both of them. It's sad, really, because I mean, nine that nine months is is quite an investment in 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 the relationship, and 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 it did seem like uh, they were a wonderful match, but then, you know, that you, you know, no matter what they say, if there isn't the in-person chemistry, it's just not likely to happen. And, and clearly there was no in-person chemistry, at least on Emma's side. I mean, I guess Richard was all in. He was like, Hey, this, this chick is, he scored, right? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I've, I've spoken to some of uh, Richard's friends, or Sam, some of Sam's friends while I was re researching this. Um, and one of them is part of the story as well, who, who they knew quite, Sam quite well. And they said he was the kind of person who would uh, fall in love with a potato if it showed him attention. So, <laughs> so I think he was just... Oh, my God. ...for any kind of attention off the female, you know, female species at all. So I don't think Emma was particularly important to him. It was just she was willing to... She was breathing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was all she had. Yeah. Yeah, as long as she had yeah. a pulse, that's what matters. Yeah. But it didn't. It didn't hurt either. She was an attractive young lady, correct? Uh, yes, she was. She was. Uh, yeah, yeah. She was. She was quite quite pretty. Um, so it's strange because Emma would have. She had a lot of choice. Really, she was talking to a lot of a lot of men through MySpace. So exactly why she settled on McCroskey, Sam, I don't know. Maybe she could be rented because she'd spent so long. She got the sunk cost fallacy. She put so much effort into the relationship. She thought, I'm, I must persevere with this regardless of, uh, you know, even though I've got more options out there. So maybe that's, that's who it happened. Yeah. So um, essentially then Richard uh, got on a plane and he flew all the way out from California to Virginia for this two week uh, uh visit um including a horror core festival and um tell us a bit about uh when they the festival because this was something that was a big deal for the both of them right to attend this thing and all these uh uh horror core artists that they knew or knew of and and this was the, their woodstock right yes, absolutely it was called strictly for the wicked festival it was in detroit michigan so sam flew to uh virginia and then uh emma's parents drove them up to this festival in detroit I don't quite know how far that is, but it seems quite a long journey. Um, so they would have had this awkward time together for like probably 10 plus hours, I imagine, in a car, going all the way there. And then they got to this festival, and yeah, this festival was like their Woodstock. It was, um, I think it was a two-day event, and every horrorcore artist, every, well, I say every horrorcore artist, there's like five or six major ones, <clears throat> and they were all on the bill. And it's kind of where... You know, because it's such a niche community, pretty much everyone, every horrorcore fan in the country kind of kind of goes there. Uh, so yeah, so Emma had this, you know, it was her plan to mingle with all these people that she'd known online but never met in person. It was a chance to meet all her favourite artists. Uh, but for Sam, it was a completely different story. He was just going because he wanted to be with Emma. And then when they got there, Emma was kind of being socialite and, you know, going meeting everybody sam was you know at the back watching she, she sort of Gigi. pretended he wasn't with her uh, essentially just trying to get just get shot of him there i'm trying to busy she was there yeah talking to other other men other boys as well which you know that's should she have done that i don't know that's uh see there are some like elements of this story that are kind of controversial because should she have been so harsh to him you know i mean she invited him to her house uh, I mean, I don't blame him myself. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, also, you know, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's just how it is, you know, I mean, I, I, we could, we could say, oh, well, you know, she was a teenager, she probably could have handled it better, but look, I'm sure we know plenty of adults who handle things even worse. So uh, that's. Before this, she did say to him that it's not going to go any further. On. I mean, she was okay. that uh, their relationship was, you know, platonic and he was just a friend. So, yeah, I mean, you can't really blame her for that. You've, uh, she did what she, what she could. She told him the truth and then went off and met other boys. So, yeah, I don't think she can really be blamed for that. No, no, no. If she was straight with him about it, but obviously he didn't quite get the message, did he? I mean, um, mm -hmm. he did not want to take no for an answer. And, and I mean, he was really invested in this relationship. So, um, he, he kind of was um, behaving like a spurred, spurred lover, a rejected lover, even though he wasn't her lover, right? Yeah, and he kind of thought that if we go to this festival together, maybe I can worm my way in and, you know, get in her good books and then win her over. I don't know why he thought that, because in a social environment like that, he was not going to stand out at all. You know, she was going to be off with good-looking people who, you know, with social skills that would be a much better partner for her. So I don't know why he even thought that was an option, but that was what he tried to do, and he failed, as you know. All right. So uh, now, now for the for the real nitty gritty here. Um, essentially, we're we're talking about a story that revenge. Uh, we would say revenge was uh, his motivation here. Um, they get back from the festival, and uh, things don't uh, quite go <laughs> as anyone expected. Yeah. They got home a few days later, and then, of course, there was still another week where Sam was staying at Emma's house. And that same night, Emma, her friend Melanie, also a horrorcore fan, <clears throat> and Emma's mom, they all went to bed, and they would never wake up again because that same night, Sam went into the garden. He found an axe, and he went from bedroom to bedroom, and he uh, battered their, caved their skulls in with an axe one by one, and then piled all the bodies up in a bedroom. But they didn't end there either. And then things got kind of even worse after that. Because, do you want me to go into that part now? Or do you want to stop on that part? No, well, I mean, uh, I mean, you would think that he would kill Emma, right? I mean, because she's the one who, quote, rejected him. But, but he essentially... Uh, took out everyone who was in the household and and as we're hinting at um, anyone who maybe had the misfortune to visit the household inquiring about where everyone is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so it's a mass murder. Yeah, it was a family annihilation. Really. So um, yeah, so we caved all their skulls in one by one. The, the fortunate part is that they were all asleep when it happened. So. <laughs> The autopsy said they didn't feel anything. So that's, you know, you shouldn't have to look at that. That means advantage. Well, I don't know. I mean, even if you're asleep, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I don't know if they could ever guarantee that, can they? Yeah, absolutely. But then, yeah, uh, we don't want to find out. You know, hopefully we won't. We, we yeah, hopefully, hopefully we won't. Hopefully hopefully we won't. Um, uh, and um, to, to, to make this even more horrific, um, uh, Sam stayed in the household with these corpses for Two, for several days, right? Days, yeah. He um, he stayed with them because he didn't know what to do because he was there with three dead bodies and he was a teenager, so he was thinking, "What the hell do I do now?" And all the time he was in the house, the phone continuously rang because it was Melanie's parents wondering where their daughter was because she hadn't replied to a text for. Melanie's uh, the girlfriend of uh, of Emma's, right? Who came along? Yeah. Yeah. So, and they were phoning them constantly. No one was answering. So Sam would have been in his house with a pile of bodies and constant ringing phone. So at one point, the next day, he has a knock on the door. Sam, he goes around the back of the house, slips out, and goes to the person at the front door, meets Emma's dad. Who, you know, her parents had split up and her dad lived somewhere else. But he hadn't been able to contact Emma or, or her mom either. And he went round to the front door. Sam went round and asked this guy who he was. It was Emma's dad. And little did know, little did know, Emma's dad was talking to the man that had just murdered 
his daughter. And he said, where, what, have you, do you know who's in this house? Do you know why no one's answered the door? And Sam said, they've gone on a, they've gone to a restaurant. They'll be back soon. And then Sam said he was their neighbor. The dad left, Mark. And then Sam went back in the house. The phone carried on ringing. It was Melanie's parents again. And then eventually he answered. He answered the phone for some reason. And he told them the same story. He said they'd gone to a restaurant. Try back again in a few hours. Uh, and by that point, Sam was starting to panic because he was thinking, someone's going to realise now that these people are not here. And I've just shown yeah. myself to someone who might recognise me. And I've given my voice away to someone who might recognise me. So... Another 24 hours, he stays in the house and he films himself with the corpses because he's apparently he made a music video while he was in the house with these dead bodies, but which has never been seen, unfortunately. Well, I'll say unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, so how he comes to a head is that Mark, the same thingy, same uh, parent, he goes back the next day where Sam is hiding in the shadows with the same axe that he used to kill rest of the family. Mark comes in the house, he's got a key. Got a key. Sam attacks him with uh, the axe, uh, knocks him down, beats him so hard that the, the floor below him obliterates and leaves him for dead. Then Sam, he sees the opportunity, he takes Mark's car and he tries to get back to California where he, you know, he hopes he'll somehow get there and don't be apprehended on the way, which was very optimistic of him. So yes. he left a house with four dead bodies in there and tried to flee to California. That was when the, uh, uh, how we, you know, how someone found out was uh, Melanie's parents continued to ring the house and no one answered, obviously, because there was no one there and it was dead. So the person that she rang was one of the artists that performed at the festival. And uh, this is uh, actually the, the person who, um, who answered the call is pretty much a friend of mine now. I kind of uh, kind of came close to him. Um, and he received a call from Sam not long before that, and he confessed to pretty much what he did. He rang this guy named Sif Tanny and said, I've just killed four people. What the hell do I do? And then just <laughs> move on, Sif, Sif Tanny. Talk about rap names. <laughs> Sif Tanny. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, and he had to tell Melanie's parents that their daughter was dead. Oh, That's man. Called the blood police. They went there. They found this, you know, this bloodbath massacre, family and an Um Yeah, th three of them were piled up together. And the father's body was, uh, was in the hallway still. And that's when they realised that Sam had fled his, fled his car. And then assumed that he'd be going back to California because he was pretty obvious who the, who the perpetrator was because people had seen Sam with Emma and Melanie the last few days, so there was no real difficulty in determining the suspect. He was just fine. Yeah. God, I mean, you know, that's just uh, that's just horrendous. I mean, the, uh, uh, the whole, everyone in the house, uh, people who came to the house, um, and all because the online MySpace romance uh, didn't yeah. quite turn out as he'd hoped it would turn out. Um, just, you know, I, I, an interesting question. I, you know, when I before, you know, I had this going on. You know, I jot down just some ideas. But I was wondering, do you think um, uh, uh, Sam uh, would have been a loose cannon, anyways? And if it hadn't have been Emma and his perceived. Uh, romantic rejection by her that at some point in his life something else would have triggered this and and he may have been a, a murderer at you know of someone else's or else's yes that, i think he pretty much would have it was um it was pretty much a ticking time bomb i would say he was um i mean it didn't help when he was so young and this was his first relationship but i think he had anger issues as well like, this has been said after He's like he's been evaluated in prison. He's found he's got a very short temper, you know, intense, severe anger issues. So I think any kind of incident that would spark him off, you know, others would have been subject to his wrath, even if it wasn't wasn't Emma. I think Emma was just the first, and luckily the last. 
you know, you kind of wonder too if, in a way, he's got a lot of similarities with uh, these kids who go in and uh, do the school shootings, which seems to be a, a popular trend in the United States uh, mm -hmm. that never gets changed because no one changes the gun laws, unlike what happened in the UK when they had an incident and they did something in Australia as well. But um, I mean, do, do you kind of think, do you see a little parallel? I mean, in that case, it wasn't necessarily a spurned thing, but the, some kid just decides that something pissed him off and he just goes on a rampage. Well, I remember when I was doing the story for the anthology, there was a line that I put in and then took out at the end because I thought it was too opinion, you know, too opinionated rather than fact. You know, got opinion. And I remember I said, I wrote, he was a school shooter in a mass murderer's body. You know, he would have, um, under other circumstances, he would be a textbook school shooter case. You know, he wanted to get vengeance on the people that he perceived had wronged him. Uh, and he just happened to be in this circumstance rather than in a school environment. So I think he does share the exact psychopathology as a school shooter. He just, you know, he portrayed his rage in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, if if he would have been a little bit younger and still in school, he obviously he wasn't in school any longer, right? Yeah, I mean, he was he was a, a grown man, even nineteen, and had a job. So unlike uh, Emma, who was still a schoolgirl, right? Yeah. So it was kind of a, a the, the next way to do his wrath. You know what I mean? Like he didn't have access to a school and the people that bullied him as a child. So he would have to go on to the the next people in line, which would be the people in you know. The relationship, uh, the people, women who rejected him, I suppose, would be the next people in the line. So yeah, a school shooter in a mass murderer's body. Remember, but well, like, you know, the, the, the postal, you know, the going postal thing, you know, about uh, it going into your workplace and doing something. So, yeah, it does sound like if it hadn't have been this, something else would have come up. So maybe it's a, even though we have all these poor people that were killed um, for nothing, um, at, at least we got him at 19 locked away before he <laughs> maybe no. did something even worse, if that's possible. It's funny because, I say funny, you know, um, I have a column boy. Remember who that got blamed on Marilyn Manson and heavy metal music? Uh, wouldn't they had nothing to do with it? Really. I mean, there's a lot of things to hate Marilyn Manson for, but Colin Byron wasn't one of them. So, but this again, it's music oriented. But in this way, it kind of was music's fault in a, in a weird way. Or, or then again, maybe horror groups to tracks the kind of people that have these, you know, urges. And want to find out what the But it's strange because I mean I've always been fascinated by cases that involve musicians, There's, and in particular heavy metal and oracle musicians, because you kind of think that that music would be an outlet for the problems you've got, so you wouldn't need to be aggressive or you know to follow insults. But Sam did, so it's kind of uh, something to something to think about. Right? Well, also, though, I mean, uh, horrorcore wasn't exactly an accepted form of, of music or rap music, and, and this kind of put paid to them ever having much legitimacy for this genre. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's strange because <clears throat> rap in general deals with similar things, but like g yes. gun bars, gang bars and all that, and that's accepted, but horrorcore is not, so it's, uh, it's a weird juxtaposition. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you could say, well, did the music uh, trigger trigger this in him? I mean, obviously, it was something was in there in the first place. But I mean, what what was it? Some many years ago, there was a big lawsuit. A uh, Judas Priest, uh, the guys from Judas Priest, were being blamed for some uh, murder, right? Satanic. If you uh, remember that one. Yes, I do. I, I wasn't born, but I remember it. There was um, you know, accused of putting satanic messages in their sons. And they had to play them backwards in court. And it's really funny if you've ever seen the footage. And I, I think Black Sabbath got the same treatment as well. They had yeah, to, probably. Uh, they had to, with the, the lines they were accused of putting satanic messages in, they had to play them backwards in court on like a vinyl player. And they had to say like what they thought the lyrics said. <laughs> and they were just coming out with all this absolute rubbish. And it's so funny yeah. if you watch the footage. But now that's, that's what everyone else dealt with. And I suppose horrorcore is kind of an extension of, of that. Having said that, we don't hear about everyone else in the horrorcore genre that's going out committing mass murder, do we? 
Yes, that's true. Yeah. If yeah. you ever search horrorcore online, the first thing you find is this movie. It's it's just ruined the whole uh, genre forever. Really, you can never really get away from it now, which is a shame for yeah. other, other artists who are like real genuine people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's just a completely um, horrific story um, about a you know a wasted lives for for nothing. But um, you know, you kind of wonder. Well, didn't uh, uh, Sam's he lived with his dad, right? Yeah, yeah, his dad. It's just, and now they didn't have a really great relationship, did they? So, I mean, you kind of think, well, didn't anyone notice this kid is a loose cannon? And, the, the, you know, maybe this, you know, we need to get some serious help for him. Well, it's weird. If you look at his lyrics, because his songs are still available to, to view and download and stuff. If you look at his lyrics, he basically just talks about murdering people constantly. But you assume, <laughs> because he's an artist, that yes. he's playing a character. But it turns out that he's not. He, he's the character. Yeah, yeah, he, he lives the live in the role. But there's so many other people that do the same thing and don't turn into mass murderers. So it's, I, can, I can see why some people might just think he was being a, a juvenile, you know, trying to be an angel lord kind of thing. So yeah, it's hard to see. But you think his parents or his dad would have noticed. Maybe something is a little bit but you know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you kind of wonder if he's thinking that now, like, gee, I maybe I should have paid a little more attention to my son and what the hell he's up to and 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 why he's the way he is, you know. Absolutely. But I guess that's that's another story to <laughs> to pursue. Um, well, uh, we've been we've been talking about Joe's story. Uh, I've seen the dead come alive. Um, Joe, do you have any uh, new projects in the works you'd like to tell us about? Any any uh, teasers? Uh, yeah, I've got I've got two books coming out in the next two months. One is much better than the other. One is. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, That's not a way to sell your book. Is it now? So, I don't get paid as much for this one. The um, one book is called Killers Walking Free, and it's um, about all of the murderers that I've met in real life. Oh, my God. Which are now walking the streets free. That should be quite fun. And the other one I've got is a book I've been working on for nearly five years now, so hoping it's good. <laughs> otherwise I've got no excuse if it's not it's called uh, The Boy in the Walls and it's about the true story of Daniel Laplante if you have, are familiar with that name I think we've talked about him a few times but yes yes yeah. we were talking about that a long time ago when I think we first got together with with yeah. um, ideas and pitches I was going to do it for your first book I believe yeah we I think so I don't know what happened that we didn't end up going that way but yeah. But yeah, no, it's a fascinating story. Um, the short story is he was obsessed with this girl, another, you know, juvenile lunatic. <laughs> who, uh, obsessed with this town and he took stalking to the extreme. He lived in her house without her knowing for several months. Oh, uh, creepy. Come out of the walls and he would terrorise her and then return to the walls. And then he progressed to homicide a few years later. And now, yeah, this book is going to be big deal because I've interviewed everybody. I've interviewed the girls that, that it happened to. I've interviewed all the police officers that arrested him, people on the trial, all the jurors, all these, some of his family members. So yeah, it's going to be good fun. And it's already been optioned for a documentary as well. That should be good. Oh, cool. Hey, you're going to compete with our other contributor, Mark Fryers, who does a lot of stuff for like a Discovery ID. Does he really? Oh, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. No, it's been picked up by a LA production company and they're doing a definitely a documentary they also want to do a film a fictionalized film very so that should be uh that should be a lot of fun oh, which I, which LA company is it because I've had some queries like I keep I'll get like messages from some of these production companies oh Dan you know let's talk about maybe doing something with your books and then you know nothing ever happens but which one was it in LA it's called art and entertainment media it's a very, very oh, okay. it's um, I don't know them the guy at the who runs it is you know Eli Roth yeah he's in Glorious Bastards and Hostel he's the man at the top I've been on the talked to him a few times on the phone and he's, he's a nice guy oh that's exciting it's good fun yeah put in yeah. a good word for your beloved editor Mitzi what shall I what do you want me to say have you got any stories anything <laughs> 
always do is ask, oh, if you've got any other properties that you want to uh, auction. Yeah. I haven't. <laughs> so, so I mean, I'll get your stuff in the bag first or in the can, so to speak, yeah. and then you could give me a plug. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to live in LA. I, you know, it's time for a visit again, visit old friends. You know? <laughs> oh, you LA. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Did you mute yourself? Uh, yeah, I guess it was like inevitable. It has to happen. It Sorry. <laughs> I around a lot. I lived in LA for quite a long time. I mean, um, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, you kind of, it's, it's a rite of passage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was in, there's, weirdly, there's another documentary being done about Daniel LaPlante as well, which I did my part for over Skype because I couldn't get to, because they filmed it in LA and I couldn't yes. get there. I had to do my over, over Skype. Um, and some of the people from the case went to LA and they're all kind of like countryside folk like me. They're all like, they're not used to the big cities. And I talked to them when they got back. I said, what was LA like? They said, it's horrible. It's the worst place. <laughs> <laughs> it's just full of boundless people and drugs and police are on the streets. And I was like, okay, I think I would better look at the escape not go in there then. Well, you live there, so yeah, you've got my... Uh, Sympathies. Yeah, you know, it was fine while it lasted, but I don't think I'd ever want to go back. <laughs> it looks like hell, to be honest. <laughs> Between the air quality and the traffic and the and the and the just too many, too just too many people. I don't I, I get more and more like I, I like want to be more away from people the older I get, you know, like go away, don't come to me, don't call me, don't ring the bell. Where do you live now? Oh, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. Where's that? It's the place. It's the place with lots of trees and lots of rain. Ah uh, no. Okay. Yeah. So I I just moved to the countryside like three months ago from living in a little shitty town all my life. And it's like it's so great not having to see people when you when you yes. get up in the morning and you can just go outside and it's just quiet for miles and it's like oh, it's just, fantastic well that was my plan in the uk was uh to finally get out into the countryside and then things just happen and unfortunate unfortunate things happen and then now it's you know but but i mean i love the, the english countryside it's fabulous yeah it's nice i mean i'm in shropshire you know, if you were ever visited. oh nice yeah it's not too bad it's much better than the suburbs of the west midlands yeah so, i know i know <laughs> i've been there i know <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Oh well, um, we've been chatting with Joe Turner. Um, uh, he's uh, his story. I've seen the dead come alive, which is in the best new true crime stories: crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge. And uh, we've heard about his revengeful story about Psycho Sam, the horrorcore rap artist. I think this is the best one of the all that you've done. I know. I know. I've got a say that. <laughs> the best one that you do. It's um, it's much more varied, even though there's a central theme. If you know what I mean, like all the other yeah. national different stories from all over the world, from you know child killers to the Yorkshire Ripper, and it was all kind of all over the place. But this is very tight and constrained, but with, but also has got a lot of um, so those differences as well. If that makes sense. But this is yeah, I well, I, I think because the theme, because I, I had the door open a bit more with the crimes of passion or obsession or revenge, so we can kind of cover a bit more. But, you know, yeah. I'm kind of like, you know, you know, you know, when you ask a band what's their favorite album and it's always the one that just came mm -hmm. out. That's sort of how I am with the, you know, it's the one that just came out. You know, what I noticed yesterday as well. I was reading this yesterday just to brush up on it. You've got an uh, endorsement from Harold Schechter for other friends. I mean, that's that's he's the man he's been doing he's the man yeah. he's the man and he's not easy to get a hold of when you email him you have to do that that uh you know uh, the security code thing oh okay <laughs> oh, did you get to him directly? i get all my own endorsements like i solicit them all i i i oh. uh, reach out to everyone and and it's yeah. always really thrilling when you get someone like Harold Schechter. and i mean i've had some incredible endorsers for these yeah. books and it's just yeah. such a it's so flattering that they take the time to actually say something great about your book. 
Do you think you're actually ready? Do you, do you send your approved copy? Well, I send sample stories. I mean, I, I have to get endorsements well in advance because it's too late by the time print is coming. So um, I basically will put maybe six or seven stories together and I send them a PDF with those sample stories to give them a, an overview of the book. Books now as it happens. So I'll do so I will check that he's the man. I, uh, he's the man. <laughs> Well, well if, if he's you, watching, Harold, you're the man. Harold, if you um, have you ever heard him talk? Uh, I no. Oh God, he, he goes up at the end of every every sentence, so it sounds like everything he's asking is a question. But he's a great guy. I worked with him years ago on a. We were on the same documentary once about murder of Bia, and I got to talk to him, and he's a great guy. He's really, really knowledgeable. Uh, yeah, he. I think he's also a professor, isn't he? He's just retired. He was a professor at New York University, Queen's University, of criminology. Okay. And he's just retired to, according to him, play video games all day. So I'm, I'm very jealous. <laughs> and write more true crime, probably. Yes. Yeah. yeah he's, oh, he's the man. He's 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 like the the gold standard, really. So I was amazed that you managed to managed to get through him. Oh uh, yeah, I'm always amazed when I get some of these endorsements, and I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> Right. Well, it, you know, it, it, it feels like uh, it's, it's a sign of respect, you know, when, mm -hmm. when somebody who's, you know, when, when these incredible writers and, and very prestigious writers will mm -hmm. take time from their busy schedules, because I know I, I I can't even do endorsements. I'm so it's like, when would I have the time? But they they do it. And I'm like always amazed. No, amazing. I was tr trying to get him for my new book, but I thought he's just going to be so impossible to get hold of me. Give him a shot. Okay. You never know. Just remind him of the old days at the Murderpedia or whatever it was. Murderpedia. <laughs> <That's still going. laughs> well, thanks again, Joe. I appreciate it. And your new projects sound really exciting. Thank you very much. Can you endorse my new project, by the way? Yeah, I'll endorse it. So send me something so at least I know what I'm talking about. But sure, I'd be happy to. Send you the manuscript over. Do you want the whole thing or just a sample? Um, well, I probably, how long is the whole thing? <laughs> uh, about 45,000 words. Um, you know you what? Send me the best yeah. part. So the yeah, yeah, part. send me the best part. <laughs> and tell me when you need it by. <laughs> last week, probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't wait till the last week, minute, yeah. though. <laughs> Yeah. I'll Jesus, you. you can make book deadlines like that. It was due last week. Oh, I haven't even started chapter one. And, uh, oh, yes. I'm there every week with the ghostwriting I do. So, yeah, I know exactly how it is. But I'll send something over that's, that's enjoyable to read and just, just say it's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll definitely, I'll give you a, I'll give you a glowing review. Thank you so much. Thank you. Glowing endorsement, rather, not a review. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks so much again, Joe, for having uh, for coming on, and I guess I'll probably see you again for another book. The next one for the, for the next one, pencil about three hours because I'm going to talk about that case for a long time because that's what I've been waiting to talk about that case for ever. So yeah, pencil in like three or four hours. Great. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, thanks again for coming on, and uh, again, the book. The best new true crime stories, uh, crimes of passion, obsession, and revenge, which if you're watching and you're still shopping for the holidays, this is a fabulous gift. You can order one for everybody you know, the, the, your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, uh, uh, the local, uh, uh, you know, get the postman, everybody. <laughs> everybody needs to read this book. Yes, it's really good. It's the best one so far. There you see, you heard it from Joe and that's it, man. You know, if Joe says it, that's it. Possible. Joe's the man. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Well, well, thanks again for coming on. See you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.